Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, normally I'm a pretty calm guy, unless I'm about to be late for my own wedding. I'm a little bit of an optimist, so that means that I tend to overestimate the amount of time that I have. So it was about an hour before our wedding, and all the timing seemed to be working out perfectly. Everybody was there, everybody was ready, and I thought, hmm, I've got time to go check into the hotel. So, get in the car, get going, the hotel's not very far away, hmm, may as well pick up some flowers along the way, right? All right, go to the grocery store first, there's a little bit of a line, but get the flowers. Okay, now off to the hotel, and then there's a big line, <laughs> and the people in the front are taking forever. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't pay that way. Can you pay a different way? Oh, sure, let's pay a different way. Would you like to upgrade your room for free? Well, tell me about the differences in the rooms. Let's see. Okay. Hey, is there anything to do in the area? Yeah, let me show you some brochures. All the while, I'm back there in my suit and flowers screaming on the inside. <laughs> so eventually, I finally get up the courage to beg. And I beg and they let me forward to the front and I get checked in and I, I make it back to the wedding with plenty of time, so it was fine. But that's kind of what you expect when I'm involved at a wedding, when I'm involved with the planning. You'd expect the timing not to work out perfectly. I'm human, I'm fallible. But would you expect that at a wedding where Jesus is involved? He's perfect, he's infallible. But when we heard about the wedding at Cana, it seemed like the timing was off. Things weren't running very smoothly, even though Jesus was involved. And maybe you've noticed that in your life a little bit too. Jesus is involved in your life. You're a believer. He watches over you. He works everything for your good. But it doesn't always seem like his timing is right. Like things are running smoothly. But as we look closer... At the wedding at Cana today, we'll find that we can trust Jesus' planning. We can trust Jesus as our glorious wedding planner. He'll show us that we can trust his timing and we can trust his signs. Jesus had just started his ministry with the timing of someone who had meticulously planned everything out. First, John the Baptist saw him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Shortly after that, Jesus was baptized, and God said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then right away, Jesus went out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus defeated those temptations in our place, and then he started gathering disciples, and then came the wedding at Cana. Everything was going smoothly. Boom, 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 boom. And then, at the wedding at Cana, finally, Jesus' timing seems to be a little bit off. At least to one person who was there at the wedding. Three days later, after gathering some disciples, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My time has not come yet. At least to his mother, Jesus' timing seemed to be a little bit off here at the wedding. Things weren't going so well. The bride and groom hadn't timed things perfectly, and so they were going to run out of wine. In Jesus' day, these wedding festivals could last up to a week. Seven days, so they needed to plan ahead and make sure they had enough food and enough wine for everybody, and they were going to run out early. And you can imagine what an embarrassment this would be, to run out of food at, at the wedding. And so Mary does something wonderful. She does something good. She goes to Jesus with the problem. She does what any, any one of us would have done if Jesus was there. Um, Jesus, <laughs> this seems like a problem you can handle. But you can tell from Jesus' answer to Mary that she also did something bad. Something he didn't approve of. 
she came to him and said, They have no wine. And he said, Woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My time has not come yet. Now when Jesus says woman here, it sounds more harsh today than it did back then. It was basically the equivalent of saying ma'am. But it definitely isn't mom. Jesus doesn't say, mom, let's talk about this. He says, ma'am, what does that have to do with you and me? This, this isn't a team effort. This isn't something we're going to work together on. My time hasn't come yet. Why does Jesus answer her this way? Maybe you've heard recently about uh, a government worker in Japan who's come under fire. He was their minister of cybersecurity, which means he was in charge of defending basically all of the computers, the government computers in Japan. That was his job, to make sure nobody hacked them, nobody took their information. He was supposed to defend their computers. But recently, people have been asking him to step down because they found out he's never used a computer before in his life. <laughs> He's underqualified. He's massively underqualified to do his job. That's what Jesus was trying to show Mary. Mary did something wonderful. She came to Jesus in prayer. But you can tell from Jesus' answer that she wanted something more. She was coming with a heart that said, Jesus, here's my prayer. And by the way, this is the best way to answer it. This is a way that fits perfectly with my will. And it'd be really great if you change your ministry plans, if you change all of your plans to answer the prayer in the way I want. And to that, Jesus said, Ma'am, you're welcome to come to me with prayers. But when it comes to answering, when it comes to the timing of the answer, answering in a way that fits with my plan for my ministry... What does that have to do with you and me? That's my job, and my time has not yet come. Sometimes we need to hear that too, I think. Because we have no shortage of things that we need to bring to Jesus in prayer, right? We live in a sinful world. We're sinful people. And so we have lots of problems, many of them, Similar to the problem at the wedding at Cana, everyday problems that can cause you stress, cause you embarrassment, cause you trouble, but also problems that are worse. Things that we're worried about, things that we need to bring to Jesus in prayer, and that's a wonderful thing to do. We are qualified to bring everything to Jesus in prayer, to bring our problems to him. Jesus, here it is. And we can even tell him how we hope it might be answered. But there's a big temptation to come to Jesus with a heart that says, Jesus, here's my prayer, and by the way, it'd be really great if you answer it this way, according to my timing, according to my plans, and if you don't, I'm going to be disappointed. But that's like somebody who's never used a computer before trying to defend the computers of a country, isn't it? We're not qualified to tell Jesus to expect him to answer prayers according to our will. And so, if we come in prayer like that, Jesus has to remind us too, Mr. Sir, what does that have to do with you and me? This isn't a team effort. I know how I'm going to answer this prayer in my way at just the right time in a way that fits according to my plans. Jesus is qualified to answer our prayers, isn't he? In just the right way, at just the right time, in a way that he knows is best. You can tell by looking at his ministry. Right here he says, my time hasn't come yet. What is he talking about? Not just about this wedding at Cana, he's talking about the wedding. The wedding between Jesus and his bride, between Christ and believers. He needs to fit everything into that plan. And you see as he goes along his ministry that he is. A few chapters after this, people get mad at Jesus and they try to kill him. And he says, my time hasn't come yet. And he gets away. A chapter later, they try to push him off a cliff. They're not able to. He walks through and he says, my time hasn't come yet. And then finally, 
in chapters 12 and 17, right before Jesus was going to go to the cross in just the right way, at just the right time, he says, the time has come. The time has come for the Father to be glorified, for everybody to see just how well he's planned out this wedding. And thank goodness, Jesus is qualified to do this. Because if the answer to our prayers were left up to us, if planning for our salvation, for the wedding, was left up to us, well, we wouldn't be invited, would we? We'd be left out of the wedding celebration eternally. But Jesus is in charge. He knew when the time had come, and so he did come to the cross at just the right way, in just the right time, in a way that answered not just our everyday needs, but our greatest need for salvation. We can trust that Savior with everything, with our salvation, and also with our prayers. We can trust him to answer in just the right way, and that's why Mary responded in the way she did. She accepted the rebuke, and she said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. He's the boss. Trust him. That's a way for us to respond when we offer our prayers to Jesus and look at his promises and his word to answer in just the right time. Do whatever he tells you. Wait on his timing. Hold on to his words. Do whatever he tells you. Of course, that isn't easy to have that kind of trust in Jesus when it seems like he isn't answering the prayers in a good way, when it seems his timing is off. So how do we get that kind of trust? Well, Jesus gives it to us. Just like he gave it to the disciples at the wedding at Cana. He gives us that trust by giving us signs. Miraculous signs. And boy, did he give one at this wedding. Six stone water jars, which the Jews used for ceremonial cleansing, were standing there, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet, And they did. When the master of the banquet called the bridegroom and said to him, then the master of the banquet called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the guests have had plenty to drink, then the cheaper wine. You saved the good wine until now. This, the beginning of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. I don't know about you guys, but I'll take that person as my glorious wedding planner, as the person to plan out your life, your salvation, because look how wondrously he answers Mary's prayer in a way that does fit with his plans. We don't know exactly how Mary wanted this prayer answered, but Jesus answered it in such a glorious, behind-the-scenes way There were those six stone water jars that were normally used for following the difficult ceremonial washing rules based on the Old Testament. And Jesus used those jars to foreshadow the freedom and the joy of the New Testament age that he would bring. And he didn't fill those jars up about halfway so he could fit some tricky instant wine powder. No, they were filled to the brim and he turned all of it into wine. All of it. 20 to 30 gallons in each container, which means he made the equivalent of about 500 bottles of wine. That would cover the whole front of church. Jesus answered this prayer in an overflowing way, and it wasn't just any wine. It was good wine. You probably know how wine tasters can be. Well, the wine was brought to the wine taster, and he said, Whoa! Normally you bring the good stuff out first, but you've saved the best for last. All of those ways Jesus answered that prayer were wonderful, but the main point of this miraculous sign is revealed by John in verse 11. It said, through this sign, through this miracle, Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. 
Jesus answered this prayer in just the right way, at just the right time, not just to take care of the everyday problems at this wedding, but especially in a way that created more trust in the hearts of the disciples to trust Jesus to solve their biggest need, to trust Jesus to be their eternal wedding planner. And Jesus gives us signs like that too. Well, he's given us this sign. The sign that he performed at the wedding in Cana, it's been recorded for us, passed down to us in the Bible so that we can see just how wonderful a wedding planner that we have. And all throughout the Bible, we have signs recorded for us to increase our trust in Jesus, to see just how good a job he does at planning out salvation, at answering prayers in just the right way, at just the right time. And we start most church services with a sign in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the sign you received at your baptism. Your baptism, which was a miraculous sign where Jesus didn't just watch you clothed in your cute little white baptismal gown, but he clothed you in your wedding gown as his perfect bride, ready for the wedding feast in heaven. And Jesus also gives you the sign of communion, which is pretty similar to the miracle at the wedding of Cana, where he comes to you not just with the bread and wine, but with his body and blood and gives you even more than at the wedding at Cana. He gives you overflowing salvation and a foretaste of the wedding banquet in heaven. Trust Jesus' timing. And he gives you that trust as he gives you these signs. You know, the average couple in the U.S. probably spends about a year planning for their wedding. You know how much they spend on average? In 2018, the average wedding couple spent $25,000 for their wedding. Why do they do that? Love. (laughs) In love, Jesus spent way more for your wedding. He didn't just spend a year planning. He spent his entire ministry on earth. He spent eternity planning out exactly how to take care of your wedding to him. And he didn't just spend $25,000. He spent his holy, precious blood to make sure that you could be married to him so that there would be no embarrassment when you're at the wedding feast in heaven. That's a wedding planner you can trust. So trust him. Trust his timing, trust his signs, and then prepare yourself for the party. Because that wedding banquet in heaven, I guarantee you, at that wedding banquet, Jesus will have saved the best for last. Amen. Please rise.